everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me. I just want to do a quick case summary of the Harvey's by Harvey's versus Ruciniak case out of the Indiana Court of Appeals. It really has a, a, a whole jumble of Medicaid planning elements to it, terms to it. It seems like an attorney tried to combine proactive planning tools with crisis planning tools. Um, and then the court gets into the uh, nuances of 1396P and reviewing irrevocable trust. So it really has a grab bag of Medicaid planning uh, tools and strategies all in one case. So let's dive in and take a look at what this case has to offer us. So we'll start first with the case facts. Uh, let's start with Natalie Harvey's. She's 91 years old. And she looks like went into a law office and executed a number of documents on January 25th of 2019. Uh, relevant to the, the case here, we have three children, Karen, Richard, and Anne uh, of Natalie. The first document that she signed appointed Karen, one of her daughters, as her healthcare surrogate and attorney in fact. So this is important because she's giving Karen the authority to execute documents on her behalf and then Richard and Ann as successors to Karen. The second document was titled a personal services contract. And this stated within that document that she wanted to compensate her children for the time and expenses incurred by the children in providing me with assistance and supervision, in managing the affairs of my estate, or in providing me with financial management, home health care, nursing care, and escort services as required because of my failing health, regardless of such services were skilled and unskilled. And then there is this statement in the case that according to Natalie, the children had provided nearly $900,000 worth of services dating back to 2011. So it looks like what the attorney was trying to do here is create some sort of fair compensation with a personal services contract that's looking backwards. Now, in most states, you have to have a personal services contract in place where that's allowed, and then any services that are conducted after that contract is in place uh, are, um, are, are considered uh, fair market compensation so long as the rate is reasonable and the services were actually conducted and there's a lot of you know, details in making sure that that contract is being properly executed. So what it looks like here is this attorney was trying to create some sort of fair compensation uh, somewhere between $500,000 and $900,000 looking backwards uh, to services back to 2011. And again, I'm reading between the lines here. None of that is in the case holding. Uh, in that contract, it also states the following provision. And this is where all these uh, tools start to kind of integrate here where it says that I appointed an attorney in fact in a power of attorney, and what I want that attorney in fact to do is consolidate my assets into one place to pay for services that were rendered under this contract. So now we're starting to see how all of this is starting to come together. And then the third document that was executed wasn't executed by Natalie, but was executed by her children, was an irrevocable trust, and then $557,000 worth of assets were transferred into that trust. And you'll see Karen, who was the attorney in fact, and then Richard were named as trustee of that trust. And so now we have the kids getting control of those funds under an irrevocable trust. And then the whereas provisions in that irrevocable trust were specifically drafted to say that property could be transferred into this trust that is paid for the healthcare assistance that was provided to Natalie. And also, I thought this interesting, this language was worded a little interest, in an interesting way, I guess, and curtailed any and all interest of any healthcare recipient. So basically, cutting Natalie off from any ownership right of that property. So now we've created an irrevocable trust that states in the whereas clauses that the property into this irrevocable trust was transferred because healthcare services were received by the grantor 
from the beneficiaries of the trust who are also the trustees of the trust. So it seems that this attorney was trying to do some crisis planning using pro tools that are generally used for proactive planning, namely a personal services contract and an irrevocable trust, but then underlying and setting up an argument that transfers to this trust weren't uncompensated transfers, but Natalie already received services for those transfers to the irrevocable trust. We're just paying them through this irrevocable trust and cutting Natalie off. And I think that was kind of the thinking there. Obviously, it seems to convolute a number of uh, factors, very creative. Uh, maybe this will work in the, in the end um, once this case is completely litigated all the way through, but we'll see. Obviously, a creative approach to crisis planning. Because four months later, uh, Natalie applies for Medicaid nursing home benefits. She's denied. The agency, in their finding, found that the assets were still available to Natalie so that she still had access to those funds. And so she had too many resources to qualify for Medicaid benefits. Generally, assets have to be below $2,000 for the Medicaid applicant. Here, the agency said, well, that $500,000 that was transferred into that irrevocable trust was still available to Natalie so that she doesn't qualify. She appeals that through fair hearing. The ALJ uh, denies uh, that, uh, or the, the, uh, she appealed through the fair hearing. The denial was affirmed. She then petitions for judicial review, and the trial court denies the petition for review. And then this is the appeal to the trial court's denial of reviewing the ALJ's affirmation of the agency's denial. So all this stuff kind of gets convoluted. Basically, at the end of the day, um, everyone's agreed with the agency uh, as well as the ALJ. So let's hop into how the court tried to unwrap this, this ball of yarn here. To start things off, and this is why reading these cases is always really interesting for me, is it kind of grounds you back to ground zero uh, of why the Medicaid program was uh, put in place. So it quotes some of its other cases in stating that the purpose of the Medicaid program is to provide medical assistance to needy persons whose income and assets are insufficient to meet the expenses of healthcare. Always important to remember that's where a court in analyzing any of these Medicaid court, uh, cases is going to start. And then it goes even further in stating, I thought this was an interesting quote as well, Medicaid is rocky terrain, and that terrain is even more treacherous where an irrevocable trust is involved. And obviously we have an irrevocable trust here in this case. The court also goes back and looks at kind of the evolution of the statutory construction uh, and the history of Congress in tightening the restrictions around irrevocable trust in Medicaid planning and talks a little bit about that as well. So always good to get a little history lesson before we get started into the analysis of the case. So we look back to what the ALJ did in their review of the agency's determination so that what the ALJ did is the ALJ determined that the trust assets were still available. So that analysis comes under 42 USC 1396 PD, and that's the trust section of 1396 P. And it talks about transfers and what type of transfers will make assets not countable for Medicaid purposes. So that's where the ALJ said, hey, these are still available we're um, going to count them. And so Natalie would not be qualified for Medicaid benefits because she has over the individual resource amount. But Harvey's, the family comes back and argues, well, it actually should have been analyzed under subsection C, which state those exceptions to transfers uh, when you're looking at transfers made during the look back period, uh, that those were made for uh, fair market value or other consideration. So that the exception to the rule that transfers can't be made within the last five years, one of those exceptions is if it's made for fair market value or other consideration, we won't penalize those transfers. So we have two different approaches. Uh, one under the, the agency is taking under the trust section of the statute, whereas the family wants the, the court to look at the exceptions to transfers underneath uh, 1396P. So the court comes back and what they say is first, the agency has to make 
uh, two different determinations. The first one is what resources are actually available to the applicant. And then if the applicant does not have, uh, is over resourced and is otherwise eligible, at that point, we can look and see if there's any exceptions that were that the transfers were made for uncompensated or undercompensated transfers. So first we have to figure out this availability issue, then we'll look and see if there's any exceptions to the transfer rules. So how do we determine if transfers to a to an irrevocable trust under 1396 PD are considered available resources? So we look back to the statute and the statute states um, Trust assets shall be considered available if the assets of the individual were used to fund the trust, uh, the person establishing or entity establishing the trust had legal authority uh, to do so, and, and this is where the any circumstances co test comes out of, are there any circumstances under which payment from the trust could be made to or for the benefit of the individual? So that's the availability test for assets within an irrevocable trust. Then, if an applicant is otherwise eligible, we'll look at 1396 PC, uh, which then we'll figure out whether or not any compensated or uncompensated transfers were made. So how do we do that? In subsection C, that states that an individual is eligible if a satisfactory showing is made that an individual intended to dispose of the assets either at fair market value or for other valuable consideration. And that's obviously where uh, the Harveys are making their argument is under that subsection and the or the assets were transferred exclusively for a purpose other than to qualify for medical assistance or all assets transferred for less than fair market value have been returned. So those are those exclusion to two transfers made in the look back period are under subsection C. So Harveys argues that the transfers to the trust were made to compensate her children for the services they provided her over the years under that personal services contract, and she disposed of the assets for other valuable consideration, so they shouldn't be penalized. However, the court disagrees and say, wait, we have to look and see if this applicant is otherwise eligible first, then we'll look to see whether those transfers were made uh, for fair market value, and the Harvey's argument is putting the cart before the horse. The court rules that the ALJ looked at the first two elements of that irrevocable trust test where Harvey's assets were used to form the corpus of the trust, so it was the grantor's property, and the trust was established by a person with legal authority to act. That was under that power of attorney. The kids created the trust, so that's all good and fine, but the ALJ never undertook the any circumstances test that's, that, that we would look to the trust to see if there are any circumstances under which payment from the trust could be made to or for the benefit of Natalie. So until this is determined, it cannot consider whether or not there was, there was consideration for the transfer of assets to the irrevocable trust. So we can't even get to those exceptions until somebody does a, does a thorough analysis of whether or not the trust language states that Natalie would benefit from this trust under any circumstances. So because that was never done, the court denies, um, basically says, hey, we need to send this back to the agency. So the way they do that is the denial for the petition for judicial review from Natalie is reversed and the case is remanded back to the trial court. So the trial court gets this case back with instructions to grant the petition to review. So yes, you can review it, but we're gonna return it back to the agency for further proceedings on the third element. So the court doesn't really get into whether or not um, any of these strategies actually work. What they're focusing this holding on is whether or not the agency has looked and considered the actual language of the trust to see if Natalie can benefit from that 500 plus thousand dollars that were transferred into the trust. So they, kind of figure out a way not to get into this personal services agreement with retroactive consideration and whether or not that would qualify for an exception um, underneath the transfer exception uh, rules under subsection C.
So this case, going all the way back to the agency, we have to look at the trust language. None of that was provided in the holding. Um, in the footnotes of the case, it does state that Natalie passed away while this case was working through uh, the process. And so I don't know if we'll ever see this actually come to fruition, but is an, is an interesting case. Again, very creative by the attorney using some proactive planning strategies and crisis planning. Um, doesn't look like it got very far and the courts don't seem to really want to take this up too far. And so they've remanded all the way back to the agency to look at the language of the trust. So I don't know if we'll see this case again, but I thought it was an interesting case dealing with uh, crisis planning uh, using some different tools that aren't traditional. And uh, one thing that we generally teach in our courses, if you're doing crisis planning, stick to what's tried and true in your state, uh, because generally what we're trying to do is get the person qualified as soon as possible, obviously, unless there's some glaring um, some glaring overstep by the state agency. So I uh, thought it was interesting, thought it was a uh, interesting holding as well, and a lot of good history and analysis of 1396P uh, in this case. So hopefully that was helpful and enlightening for you. Take a look at that case. Uh, please join us for um, any other series that we have um, under this Behind the Case series. And thank you for visiting uh, with us. You can always find more information at KrauseFinancial.com. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.